Welcome to Unstoppable at Craig, where we pull back the curtain on what makes healthy workplace cultures click and what happens when people are empowered to expand the boundaries of what is possible. We'll explore the perspectives of employees and leaders who have carte blanche to speak their truths, tell their stories, and unlock uncommon ways of approaching challenges. I am Dr. Jandell Allen Davis, CEO and President of Craig Hospital, a world-renowned rehabilitation hospital that exclusively specializes in the neurorehabilitation and research of patients with spinal cord and brain injury. Join me as we learn from people who love what they do and what happens when fear doesn't stifle innovation. I could not be more excited to be here, getting to do this particular conversation with my dear, dear friend, Ryan Heckman, who I met in one of the most unusual of ways when Governor Hickenlooper was our governor and the two of us were exploring what public service would be like. And in different ways, I think we both figured out we could do a lot more from the private sector, but we'll get into that. Ryan, welcome. Thanks for making time. I am excited to be here. Thanks. Ryan, I think it'd be really great because you have had a really, I'd say, this may sound big, but storied career, but also such a a dynamic and unique, but in some ways, that's what makes it storied and cool sort of path over time. And I just love it just to sort of contextualize this great conversation we're going to have. If you just tell the story of Ryan Heckman, whichever chapters you want. Uh, I grew up in a really small town in, in Granby, Colorado, which was small and probably small then in 1982 and even smaller probably today. I just wanted so badly to go to the Olympics. It was just something that was inside of me and I can't explain why, but I progressed quickly and I was the youngest Olympian that represented not just my sport, but the whole United States Olympic team. Mm -hmm. I was 16 in Albertville, France uh, and competed there. And I competed again in 94 in Lillehammer, Norway. And then I wanted to go to college. The next Olympics were in 98. So it was a long time to wait for a third Olympic Games. And I was really feeling kind of dumb, you know? I mean, I, I didn't go to high school. And funny enough, when I decided to go to college, I was like, what's the best college in, in the United States? And someone said, uh, Stanford is. So I sent my application into Stanford University. I was 22, probably 20, yeah, 20, no, I was 21. And I had no GED, no ACT, no SAT and really no GPA, I went to a ski academy and, and kind of got the, you know, pass, if you will, passing grade. Mm-hmm. You know, I got like a like a no letter from Stanford that wasn't very long. It didn't even say we're going to keep your, you know, application on file. It was mm-hmm. almost like a cease and desist order, like don't ever come to California, <laughs> you know? And so I was pretty upset. Now I look back, I was just naive, you know? Right, but, right. Yeah. But A for effort. And then I applied to my backup school, which was the University of Colorado, and I got denied there. And I was like, oh, my gosh, like, I am not going to be able to go to college. And what am I going to do? Um, never mind, I couldn't afford it, you know. And so the librarian from my hometown went behind my back and went to the director of admissions at CU. And he put me on probation, but let me into CU. Not only did she call, but she and her husband paid for my entire college, oh, wow. which is, oh wow, you know, <laughs> pretty amazing. I get teary eyed when I think yeah. about that. But I did go to CU and and worked my tail off, and then um, I rode on an airplane with a fellow uh, who owned Vale Resorts at the time, a guy named George Gillette. You you might have heard of mm-hmm. him. Um, he owned a number of assets all over the country, and we rode on an airplane when I was sixteen to Zurich. And we talked the whole flight and he said, when you graduate from college or if you graduate from college, give me a call, I'll give you a job. And so little did I know that I was applying for a job in private equity, which, you know, recruits not only from the Ivy League, but from the Ivy League MBA programs. And I had an undergraduate degree from the University of Colorado and he gave me a job as he said he would. And I have now been investing and building companies now. I'm celebrating my 25th year. Wow. There's so many threads in that. I hear striving and longing in the, I'm going to go to the Olympics and darn if you didn't do it. You know, we we say, I call them God winks. Others call it luck. 
Others would call it even privilege in some different ways, but just right place, right time, right people who saw in you what you might not have even been able to see in yourself, which brought about this remarkable journey that brings you to today. I think the sense of privilege is probably more about all the people that helped me along the way, you know, versus the actual outcomes. You know, that John Kennedy, to those whom much has been given, much is expected. Talk about along the way a little bit. I mean, you sort of glossed over the this idea in PE or private equity, the opportunities to build lots of companies and hopefully create some great dreams for people and, and uh, you know make the world a better place. But I know there's lots of other cool ways you've made the world a better place too that are real important, I think, for those listening who are leaders to understand that whole. How are you playing in the space of much is expected of you? That's actually a pretty easy question to answer. I would start with, I mentioned that the librarian paid for my college. And Colorado Mountain College in Steamboat, where I competed and where Jane and Ed Hill lived, who Mm -hmm. paid for my college, they had run out of money and they were building an auditorium to serve the community and the, the students that went to school. So I paid to build the auditorium in their name. Wow. And that felt, (laughs) that felt Uh, (laughs) divine. Well, I can see on your face, it still feels divine. (laughs) It it felt great. And that kind of, you know, like anything, you kind of get that uh, appetizer, uh, that spark, um, that that kind of rush of, oh, that feels good, you know? And I had not experienced that yet. And so the next thing I did was I gave enough money to send 50 students through community college. Um, And it so happens that most of the community colleges in the state are located in places like Granby, you know, whether you're talking places like Sterling, Colorado or Rangeley, Colorado. And then I, I was thinking about like, what else could I do? And so I started a leadership development foundation called Civico. It provides leadership and uh, training and development to the for-profit, uh, the non-for-profit and public uh, service uh, em- employees and leaders. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do that work all over the state. And it's really meant to help people move from career aspirations to becoming a community leader like you, Jandel, and mm-hmm. George Sparks, and many of the folks that you have on this podcast. And so that work uh, has really consumed me over the last 10 years and has been maybe even better than those first two examples I gave because it's more, I guess it has uh, more legs to it. it. It's not like a one and done. A one and done. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. So I'm, I, that work has been great. And I say that it's given me a lot more than, it, it, than I've given it. The work that I get to do in the community has given me a particular lens to say that we can do private equity much differently. I can do it differently and I can do it in service to um, others as opposed to being a profiteer, if you will. You know, I think you know I serve on the Federal Reserve Bank Board and I said the story in healthcare today is mergers, acquisitions, divorces, and PE. <laughs> and uh, and so it's funny. and it's it, at least in Colorado for sure we're in some, I mean, you can get whiplash watching the changes that are happening in the market. And the reality is we don't talk about M&A as the evil, whatever, but there's a good and a bad side to that. There's a good side to that time where you know it's time to sort of separate, as we're seeing in a couple of big systems here in town. And I'd love to have both sides of PE. You know, to say private equity is bad is a little bit like saying banking is bad or getting Mm -hmm. a loan for your house or a mortgage is bad. It's just private equity is a source of capital at the end of the day. It's an enabler. And if you don't have enough debt or your own money, you got to get it from somebody. So in essence, a private equity fund is like a a lender or a Mm -hmm. bank, and you're going to them for a loan that's probably due in five years. And with that loan, because it's very risky, the private equity firm wants a say in how the money is spent. Now, the problem with private equity is oftentimes private equity professionals have never run a business. And so they want to have say on things that they're not competent to opine upon. And that's where it probably gets a lot of the bad rap is kind of this ivory tower, you know, backseat driving profiteer. Um, and so, you know, it's very easy, I think, to to rip on the industry, but I actually don't think it's the function. I think the function is 
is what it is. Yeah, we did a podcast some couple back maybe on polarities. You know, and I sometimes find myself in the midst of that. And it's really hard as a physician to be in the midst of that where you've got the tension between a business to run. And we don't like to think about healthcare that way, but it is. And this amazing, wonderful thing we get to do. And it is this sacred trust of taking care of people who need us in a way that nobody wakes up in the morning saying, I think I want to be a patient. And I've said, I don't have in this role the luxury of saying one's more important than the other. We've got to balance that, the care experience, the quality, got to look at all the things that are going on externally. We should not be ashamed or embarrassed about uh, profits. We should be able to say it. Or in the, the case of nonprofits, we talk about margins, although it's still profits. It's just what happens with them. And is there the opportunity to raise all boats, including what and what shareholder value looks like if we think differently around the products we sell, the people who help us deliver those products, and the people who are upstream providing all the things we need to deliver the products. So it's a, I, I know it's doable. I get to see it every day in this place called Craig Hospital in some ways that I never would have dreamed possible. So, yeah, I think that, th that you're hitting on something really big and talking about the sitting at the table, I suspect fighting, you know, not in any, conflict is part of how you balance those two poles. And, but I'd say healthy conflict based on values and principles. Talk about yours. Yeah, I wonder, you know, I think a lot of careers sadly have been maybe ruined or people, you know, have maybe been even terminated from their organizations for what they say. But a lot of more organizations, I think, have been ruined because of what people don't say. Yes. Right? Like there's Amen. this weird yes. Yes. there's this weird thing where it takes a lot of courage to be disagreeable as an individual. And if you're in an organization that doesn't incentivize that, then the organization gets the detriment, you know, over time. I mean, some of the worst organizations I've seen as, you know, because that's what I do for a living is is buy great organizations. And for every one I buy, there's probably 20 that we don't. Yeah. Well, those other 19, I would say one of the common traits of a bad organization is, is all the things that aren't said in a meeting and all the things that are said outside of the meeting. Yeah. You know, that's the meetings outside of the meeting. You know, as leaders, I think creating that safe environment, as you said, to be, to, to encourage dissent is kind of one of those like secret sauces that's right under our nose. But like a lot of things is, is easier to say, but harder to do, you know? I mean, there's a lot of social pressure on employees and, and leadership teams to, to be liked. I mean, I think it's safe to say that one of our incentives when we come to work is to get paid for the work we do. And we like to be respected and appreciated. And sometimes if you're disagreeable, you lose the opportunity to be liked. And I don't think any of us like to feel that way. So, you know, I, I always look up to leaders who kind of come at discussions like we're describing with this great sense of curiosity and mm -hmm. respect for the dissenter's view and actually like reward people for those dissents. Now, it doesn't mean you have to agree with them. Right. You know, when people uh, do that, team members here do that, I thank them. And they know my door is open. They can say anything to me. And in fact, um, someone reminded me of something that we hadn't done, and it's work that we have to do. So we were, there was a scramble at the end of the week to get something out and to get a thank you back from the team member saying, it's just so nice to be able to raise issues with leadership and have them in, you know, answered and to be not just responded to, okay, okay, but to do something about it. And I think you actually end up, my belief is you end up creating more engagement and more people who are going to actually keep your butt out of trouble if you want to know the truth. Because there's somebody somewhere, we learned this in patient safety work some years ago for Kaiser Permanente. And I mean, to think that airplanes literally have fallen out of the sky because people were afraid to say you're running out of gas. I mean, and those are the stories from, you know, sort of the, the, the airline industry of old that as they really started viewing themselves as an ultra safe industry, the big things they had to do weren't the technology. It was really the stuff. It was this ability to speak your truth to anybody to stop the line. There's this 
His name was Professor Root. I saw that on the slide. When armed with the same information, we're likely to come to the same conclusions. Oh, that's a good one. And so, and I love that his name was Root. Get to <laughs> root the root cause, cause yeah. and stuff, and there you go. So, Very clever name. just really um, a beautiful way of putting it. Jandel, who who ha I find when I have a dissenting view, there's a certain amount of courage that someone has to have to give the dissenting view. But then there's the other side, which is, as a leader, I feel un uncomfortable or I guess like fearful I'm going to discourage them if I don't agree or I don't move forward with the path that they've recommended mm -hmm. uh, that might be in contrast to the one that, that I think is right. What is your inner voice when you, when you know someone is pounding the table on something you just know isn't right, but you want to encourage this willingness to engage in a healthy dialogue, but you know you're going to say no. Right. How do you get the courage to say it in a way? And do you, do you ever feel like you hurt someone's feelings when you don't take their input? Well, I, I frequently feel like I hurt their feelings. But I think one of the things that you mentioned that's important is that you ask lots of questions. You stay in a space of curiosity. Don't let yourself get hijacked by the emotion that they're bringing because then that it actually is a distraction as opposed to something that's very helpful. I also think that there are great ideas that come along or great suggestions or great, in this case, motions or ways of directions that you should take a place that really are about timing and framing. I'm going to give you some feedback in a positive way, you also, despite how much it sucks to have to be the, no, we are not going that way, you model leadership courage because there's sometimes that we're the only ones who can make the decision, right? And after a ton of input, sometimes we have to say this isn't a direction we're going. And it's no fun because we do worry about being liked and we do worry about, I mean, the other one is we worry about is what if we're wrong? And it couldn't happen that you're wrong, but sun comes up tomorrow. I do want to touch on a technique that I saw one of our CEOs at a really cool company called Pix Health, uh, based out of Tucson. Her name is Cindy Jordan, and she's a thought leader in the field of loneliness and social mm. isolation. And she has a an app that gets uh, delivered to patient populations all over the country uh, on behalf of payers. She actually created a culture committee cool. Cool. where she identified there were probably seven or eight of them that were super important and weren't necessarily at the high end of the org chart. And as it, as it happened, there were a couple at the high end of the org chart and a couple at the low end and a whole bunch of people in the middle. And what she uses them to do is that when she has a big decision to make, she gets their input and they talk about it. And then she takes that input into consideration. She asks them questions like, if we're going to do this, how would it be best received in the organization? You know, and so it, it gives her like this very deliberate sounding board. And then a side benefit is a sales force, if yes. you will, for change. Yes. And the reality is that you need a sales force within your organization at all levels to, to champion that change. And what she's done through this culture club is created a sales force for her to get a bunch of stuff done that may or may not have been as popular without that sales force. You know, what's beautiful about that is a few things. One, you talk about influence, which leadership, I say leadership is basically this idea of using influence to get stuff done. So beautiful example of uh, using influence and using those informal networks. Talk about strategic as all get out. You talk about lifting others up, which I think is one of the other really important things we do. The skills that she is growing and those people who don't have titles that'll either serve that organization or they'll go on to serve others just through, first of all, I mean, when you think about Gillette saying, call me <laughs> when you're through college, or the angels, when I think about that, have been in my life along the way, they see in us things we can't see in ourselves. When the call comes to do X, Y, Z, I remember when Jack Cochran, who was the executive medical director, no, he, he wasn't at the time. His plastic surgeon was on the board of the med group, called me. I didn't know he knew who I was. I'm just OBGYN doing what I do, which was working super hard, and said, you need to run for the board of the Permanente Medical Group. It's like, I knew his name. I knew, you know, my little, he's like, very important. <laughs> and uh, I said, me? And not only did I run with that sort of little tiny thing, go for it, but ultimately chaired the board, 
of the medical group for a time. And then all these other sorts of opportunities come along. So there's also that. And out of all of the things, she gave more than she got. Yeah, she got her message out. You get the, you know, you, there, you use your informal networks. But what she gave those people around that sense of, I matter, I am significant, my contributions mean something. And I'm going to say much better things about this organization outside of this room because of the opportunities given. That's just, that's leadership in my view. That's real leadership. And I love to do that here. I do it. I, I actually like dissenters. I don't like cynics. And I remember the phrase, you know, encourage dissension, but challenge cynicism. You really should. And you, can, and you can see it. You, you know the difference. But I say bring it. I get better because of it. And it takes the ability to, to call yourself, you dumb, you know what, if you miss the thing, if someone tells you. Or, you know, at 2.30 in the morning, say, thank God people know that I cannot possibly see, know, hear, or do everything. And then we have to remember that we can't see, know, do, or hear everything. And that we, it is a massive village that allows us to build great organizations. Well, and behind every one vocal cynic, there's probably at least 10 to 20 yes. that just don't have the courage or the guts to say it. Yeah. And so, you know, it's sort of like the canary in the mine. You know, I could be the Dan Ritchie of healthcare, <laughs> just keep working and working and working, even though my husband would prefer I didn't, because I love work. It, it, it fills me up in ways that are equal to the things and the passions I pursue outside of work. And I, I feel like even on the toughest days where I am, I am unhappy, there's still so many moments of joy. So how do you think about this, this idea of what seems like, how can you be joyful and unhappy? How do you think through those two things? Um, well, there's a great book right now out there by David Brooks called The Second Mountain. Oh, yes. Have you yes. read that one? Yes. Well, I David, love David Brooks. David is Brooks. Awesome. He's Holy a, cow. He's got a real way with words. Yeah. He has a whole chapter devoted to the word joyful. And his basic thesis is that happiness is a reaction to something that's you know good um, and that we, we strive to get as many good things as we can so that we're otherwise happy. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a rather diminishing way of looking at the world because you're waiting, you're hoping good stuff happens to you when you wake up in the morning. Um, joy, on the other hand, is a state of mind. It's a state of being. It's in your control, most importantly. When you wake up in the morning, it's like, am I going to be full of joy today? And am I going to share that with other people? I think it might be like the most if I, had, if I had to pick one characteristic that has the biggest return on investment or effort, uh, I would say it's choosing to be joyful when you wake up in the morning. It just so happens that spouses otherwise prefer to be with a joyful spouse. It so happens that employees like to be in a joyful organization. It so happens that people want to do business with joyful people. When you're recruiting, uh, you know, it's important. And at the end of the day, you, the joy you give ends up being the joy you, that re you receive from other people. And if you give it, you'll get it in return. And David Brooks does a wonderful job of talking about the state of mind part of this and that we can all choose to be joyful, but we don't get to choose good things to happen to us yes. so that we're happy. And so when I think about a joyful organization, I was taught that there's three things that most employees want from their organizations um, that produce a joyful one. And one is, you know, real relationships, connection, and not over football necessarily, although that's fun to talk about. Mm -hmm. What connection means in this context is knowing that what matters to Jendel matters to Ryan. Yes. And that you know that, Jendel, like what matters to you matters to me. And vice versa, when I know that what matters to me matters to you, that is the ultimate form of a relationship and a connection. And that's at the organizational level as well as the interpersonal level. So that we could call disconnection or relationships. The second one is helping everyone in the organization feel like they had an impact. Yeah. You know, when they go home at night and they're driving home, they can think of one thing that they did that left an imprint on the day 
whatever that may be, and that they're seen for it, that they're yes. recognized for that impact. I think that's a big one. And the third one is, um, you know, personal development. Does the organization, you know, give chances to me to to grow? For, in other words, am I a better version of myself every year that I'm at Craig Hospital? Now you get to cheat a little bit on this one, Jendel, because <laughs> your patients and I'm sure their caregivers love on your team a lot. But that's unique. Well, I should also add the tough part of that is it's is long hours and tough duty, mm -hmm. what, what your employees do, but they get a lot of emotional juice out of it. It's not so in other industries. And so finding ways to give employees a chance to become better versions of themselves when they're at your organization, if you can hit all three of these things, connection and real relationships, helping people feel like and be recognized for the impact that they have every day at all levels of the org chart. And, and then the third one- for growth growth. Yeah. And if you hit those three things, very likely you're going to have less turnover and perhaps more competency year in and year out with your workforce. The other thing I you probably don't know, but on this whole idea of impact, relationship and connection, the opportunity for growth, we actually looked at that kind of data at KP because we had a from our employees, we also had, because we care for them, right? I mean, it's a healthcare system. So we knew, not to by name or anything, but knew healthcare utilization. And we also did health and well-being. We did this in the uh, environment of, now I can't remember the name of the survey, but it was really looking at those a, a number of dimensions of well-being. And the places that had a higher sense of well-being also had higher employee engagement in that, and interestingly, lower healthcare utilization. Wow. So, so we have way more. Um, you know, so those are those unseen ways that toxic workplaces literally eat at our physiology, yeah. eat at our health, eat at our sense of uh, well-being. So, it all does tie together. And it's, I mean, I think people can think of this word joy through mushy lenses, but I don't think of it way. I, you know, I walk around this hospital and I see joy. I don't always see happiness. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I think I want to go to Craig. Nobody. I mean, you're touching on a big moment here in this conversation to me because there may, be a, there may not be a more profound laboratory for testing whether you can be joyful and unhappy at the same time than at Craig Hospital. I, it is a huge amen to that. And here's the thing, though, that I've taken it as I've thought about this, because I do see gratitude. I mean, if you sort of think, well, what does joy look like in action? There's a sense of gratitude. There's a sense of optimism, um, a sense where I can bring my whole self into work, a sense where I'm seen and can see you, a, a sense that at the end of the day, I can check a few boxes most days about what I actually might have accomplished in this impact space. And that there was the opportunity to stop and say, yeah, I, how's that going with, that? like, I know you well enough to know those little facts about people that allow them, gosh, they know that? It's like, yeah. And I don't know it in a manipulative way. I know it because I'm deeply interested and care about the people I care about. Well, the same thing happens with our patients. I mean, folks come here after some catastrophic, horrible accidents with some of the stories that would just, what sense does this make? And yet that's what I get to see. Gratitude, resilience, the sense of hope on steroids that, and people able to say, I can move this today. I was able to get these words out today. I am coming to terms with what are gonna be limitations and how to overcome them. And I mean, we give people hope. So, but here's the thing I said, well, why can't, how would you bottle that and give that to an acute care hospital, an emergency room, physician, nurse, folks working in ORs, folks working on medical surgical floors. What effectively we're all here to do is to relieve suffering. We're just relieving suffering. And that appendectomy, don't, don't compare an appendectomy to a spinal cord injury, don't. In both cases, what is comparable is the fact that we're here to relieve suffering. And there's great joy in being able to say, I relieve suffering. There's great joy in I delivered a baby today. There's really great joy in that. There's great joy in standing in an infusion center and treating cancer, chemotherapy, 
There's great joy when those patients, when they finish those rounds of therapy, which has become a thing now in these infusion centers where there's a big sort of dancing off into the moonlight or sunset or sunrise as that last treatment. And if we can, as as healthcare people, get back to that why, because that is the why of this work, at least for me, then it's a good day. May not, they may not all be happy. They will be filled with conflict from time to time. They will be filled with trying to figure out how you balance these poles, you know, these tensions. It's just about remembering who we serve. Well, thanks for your joyful leadership. Oh, that was jo- that was a very joyful moment. I just <laughs> <laughs> that without lunch, <laughs> so I'd say. Yeah. Well, I think we might be sort of getting down to the the end of our time together. And it, it, as you think about it, if there's just one thing that you've learned through all of your experiences, what would it be? I'll answer it in two different ways. One is the difference between like a career and a vocation. Mm. Um, and kind of the way you show up every day when you have committed yourself to a vocation, I think means that you're not necessarily trying to climb the ladder. You're, you're in service to others and you're, you're trying to add value and be significant to other people. I think that's a big choice we all have to make when we show up at work. I think it also says something about where you are in your learning journey you know i mean one of the things i'm most proud about is that i'm I'm learning at a much faster pace now than when i started my career 25 years ago and that's i think a byproduct of my dedication to the craft you know what i do and why i do it and who i do it for these are really important questions and i wasn't always that way you know Mm. i i I probably had my awakening, if you will, through you know some some big failures. Uh, oftentimes, and over time, those failures helped me realize that there is a better way to live than just trying to climb the ladder every day. You know, that that would be one thing. And the second one is just that choice we already talked about. That the one thing you can control every day is whether you're going to show up joyful or not, and mm-hmm and shine that joy on other people. I think that you can't control the outcomes, but by God, you can, you literally can control being joyful or not. It's like a choice. Mm-hmm. And the last one would just be the disappointments in life. If you've ever read the book, The Prophet, there's a chapter on holding joy and sorrow in both hands every day and realizing that life is really sloppy and yucky at times and not getting too bummed out when it's not going well, but also not getting too full of yourself when things right. are good, right? right? Like it's it's holding both joy and sorrow in equal weight in both hands on a day-to-day and month-to-month, year-to-year basis, and just realizing that part of the human condition, part of being a human is having a whole bunch of bad stuff happen to you. I would dare say that I, when I look at the most successful people, it's not how they got their success or their wins, it's how did they respond to the adversity, adversity. you know, and yeah. how do you do better in this world? And I don't think it's by winning better. I think it's by losing better. Somehow figuring out how to respond to bad things happening to you in the adversity, if you can get really good at that, I think that might be part of the ultimate way of doing well in this world. I, I really believe that. Well, what an incredible full circle back to what I witnessed in the hospital in in one phrase, which I've heard is that I would not want to go back to who I was before I was injured, because there's lots of ways to respond to these injuries. And what we have the capacity to figure out about ourselves in facing adversity is pretty transformational or has the ability to do that, and not just to transform your life, but others. I was sitting here as you were talking that last little bit and thinking, you know, what a gift it is to have so many amazing people in my life that, you know, you go back to any one of the dark periods and there were plenty growing up in my life that I never would have thought that I'd have the opportunity to meet so many great people and do such wonderful work in service to, to others. That's why I work as hard as I do, because it's and, a gift. And your poor husband, 
Uh, you are going to Dan Ritchie him. I'm going to Dan Ritchie the I'm poor sure, guy. I'm sure yeah. he knew that when yeah. you got married. I'll make sure he listens to this unstoppable episode because <laughs> he'll hear at the end, dude, I kind of like to work. I kind of like to work. It's, <sighs> it's, I like to garden. I like to do the art. I like to do all the other wonderful things I do outside of this place. But I love service and, oh. and the chance to meet and, and connect with people doing great things, which you are doing. So keep surprising us. You're a model to so many who, again, who much has been given. Just to remind them, much is expected. So, thank you. My pleasure, and it's been a wonderful, wonderful uh, opportunity. In reflecting on this time together, I'm once again struck by how many absolutely incredible leaders we are blessed to have in Colorado, doing work, big and small, but if there's a theme that runs uh, throughout the work, is this, it's this idea of having the opportunity to give back and to do your best and to dream big and actually to dream bigger than in ways that you th- didn't even think possible. You know, starting this conversation with Ryan Heckman, my dear friend, who comes from pretty humble beginnings and has managed to not just thread a needle, but to do great work and also still view his accountability and responsibility and desire to give back, whether it's repaying in a really amazing way, paying it forward, the folks who provide a college education for him, or giving college tuition for 50 kids to be able to finish community college. And this out of financial benefits that he received that could easily have been in his pocket and stayed in his pocket that he chose to do these really big ideas, big ways of giving back is really remarkable. So starting there and then being able to say that the things that employees, our team members want more than anything else is the ability to know that they are having an impact, that the fact that they came to work, that they showed up, made a difference, and our accountability and responsibility to make sure that they know that that they had an opportunity to grow and develop and stretch and and be their best selves. Ryan's story also beautifully articulates how you can, in service to doing a work, which is in the case of private equity, providing a funding stream, can turn that around. And it doesn't have to be a negative, that it really is about how you choose to show up and how you choose to engage in the work. I so appreciated his courage and being able to call out the parts of his uh, chosen profession that aren't going well or that are the ugly parts of it. And we have those in healthcare, and we have those in banking, and we have those in construction. We have those everywhere. And in the end, what he said, which I think is just amazingly important, and there was a clarity about that that we all can embody, is this notion of choosing. You can choose to do good or choose to be bad or not do good. You can choose to put your employees and those you serve first, or you can choose another way. But probably the most important thing I heard today is that you can choose joy. And if there's anything I think I've learned over this long, long career and hope to continue for a lot more years is that I always choose joy. And that motivates me and carries me through tough days and has me soaring through the good ones. And there's far more of those than there are the tough days, and that's in no small part because I have chosen to live a certain way, and I hope you as leaders, too, feel the encouragement that you can do it, too. So I want to thank you once again for spending some time with us on the Unstoppable at Craig podcast. This is Jandell Allen Davis, and until next time, be well and choose joy. Choose joy.